Well, thank you all for coming this evening. I want to tell you what Phil and I have been working on. First off, can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, so this is a little bit of eye candy just to keep the uh, machine from dying on me. Uh, let me let me talk how this all started. <clears throat> uh, many years ago, I was uh, sitting, actually, this was on a beach. This was, I don't know where this photo is from. I mean, everything's on Google. You just grab it. Uh, uh, but I was sitting on the uh, beach in Northern California staring and noticing some phenomena, in this case, uh, water waves hitting the beach. And I really struck me that there's so much physics that we get to see every day here in California in particular, um, but that one thing that had uh, sort of escaped most of us who are practicing physicists is really understanding those phenomena and using it and explaining it. And more importantly, in this case, using this as a prototype of, of way to, ways to teach physics, which is to remind um, young people in particular that the physics has direct applications to what you experience every day. And uh, so this was a sort of a germ, gem, gem or germ of an idea that was with me for many years. And it was only recently that I found the time, and in this case, uh, an excellent partner in Phil, to actually pull this together and turn it into uh, a real course that we've now taught uh, twice. And thankfully, as you'll see, it's in the curriculum now, which means we don't have to teach it all the time. Uh, others can take over. So what I want to do at the beginning here is sort of just remind you of things that you see every day where you should ask yourself, why is that? So here's an, an example. Uh, here's a fault. You notice there's a characteristic spacing, roughly speaking, of these uh, ridge lines. And you know, a physicist should look at this and say, why is that? And by the way, what's the physics that allows me to understand why this distance is the value it is? And if I can understand and explain that phenomenon, then hopefully I can learn something, in this case, maybe about the elasticity of rock. Um, this is one example. There's countless of these examples that you see every day and in many ways, it was a, a large amount of what went on in physics in the 19th century, um, but is something that in many ways has been a little bit lost. So, you know, why are redwoods as tall as they are? Or more importantly, uh, um, uh, can they get so tall that they actually buckle? A common instability in a, in a rod, if you squeeze on it, of course, is that it'll buckle, it'll bend. So you could ask this tree as it grows taller and taller, has a huge load, just the gravitation, just the gravity of all the weight on it, when will it buckle? Well, lo and behold, if you actually check, there's a relationship between the diameter of the tree and its height such that it doesn't buckle. Maybe it's not surprising, it shouldn't buckle, but the tree knows the physics um, and you know, it's for us to tease it out. Um, you know, why does fog come in? There's many, many questions. Now, all of these we're not gonna answer tonight. We're gonna give you two examples. And there's many examples. And Gene Ellis already has a question. More volume. More volume. It's on. But I was an engineer once. I know how to fix it. OK, Gene, you tell me. Tell me, Gene, tell me. Raise your hand. Nothing changing? Is it better? Up more, up more, up more. OK. Up more. Gene, are you the best test particle? Bud, can you hear me? Okay. Is that okay? Okay. So we created this course in 2004 to basically offer juniors and seniors here in Santa Barbara a chance to... Yes, better? How's that? Is that good? Is that better? <laughs> Tell you what. I'm not going to hold it. Because then I'll point it at the screen thinking it's my pointer. Okay, let's try that. Yeah, that's... Um, so, you know, what's the challenge? The challenge is basically to understand these phenomena. And the difficulty that's often the case in really trying to explain some natural phenomena is that it's quite often to get it exactly right. And of course, we tend to train students to get things exactly right. Most students who come to physics come at it for mathematics. And boy, they don't like it if you tell them to make an estimate or just kind of fudge it 
And by the way, you should at least get the units right. They don't even know units. So, you know, this course both teaches them some classical physics that's quite often, it's been lost from the curriculum, mostly just because we've got a lot to teach. Um, but more importantly, we think it really forces one to really do these things uh, that are important for a practicing scientists to figure out what really matters. And as I already said, we've taught, we've taught this now two years in a row, um, and it'll be taught this spring by Omer Blaze, who's a professor in the physics department some of you might know. And we've made this part of the standard curriculum. So what I wanted to do this evening was share with you, in this case, two examples of things that we've run across that we uh, use in our class as examples of classical physics that allow us to sort of teach the students some physics, but more importantly, show them how by explaining uh, the physics, you can really understand the natural phenomena. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Phil now, who's going to have a challenge with this. So he told me he didn't need this. He said he TA'd for so long, his voice was so loud. No one has ever told me to speak up during the talk. Okay, well, we'll see what happens tonight. Great, thanks, Lars. Uh, let's see. Okay, so tonight I'll be talking about ocean waves. So we're very fortunate to live in Santa Barbara, uh, where we can go to the beach and watch the ocean waves come in. Um, and in, K in ITP in particular, um, since they finished the new wing, uh, there's this you know, great observation room on the second floor with huge windows. And uh, you can always tell the new visitors, you know, because they're always going out to, to look at the ocean and they're you know, astounded by sunlight. Um, so, visit some cold climates, I should say. Um, so, what I want to talk about a little bit today is, if you go to the beach and you look out at the ocean and you're seeing ocean waves come in, um, what are you really looking at? Um, so, for instance, some days when you look at the ocean, um, you'll see that the waves look like kind of a mess. There's uh, waves with all different scales and they're moving in sort of all different directions. Um, and you don't see a nice regular pattern of waves coming into the beach. Uh, but other days, uh, it'll look like this, where you see these nice lines of very big waves coming into the beach. Uh, so, you know, some questions are, so what's the difference? You know, what's happening on, what's, what's happening differently on the days where you have these nice swells coming in uh, versus the days where it's just a jumbled mess? Um, also, where do these waves come from? Uh, why do they hit the beach with a certain frequency, you know, a certain characteristic frequency? Um, What's the physics of waves? Uh, and in addition, uh, what measurements do people make to try and understand waves out in the ocean? Okay, so those would be some of the things I'll try and talk about today. Okay, so the first thing to, to look into is um, these days when you see these nice regular uh, lines of waves coming into the shore. Okay, so this is called the swell. Um, so as you see, there's these very regular spacings uh, in between the wave crests. Um, if you're standing on the shore and you're um, timing, how fast are these waves coming in? Uh, because there's a roughly the same distance between each one of the crests and they're moving all at the same speed, uh, they're hitting the beach at regular time intervals. Okay, so, so um, on these sort of days it looks very regular. Uh, in addition, you'll see you know, as you move out into the ocean, um, the height of the wave is smaller. As you move in towards the shore, the height of the wave gets bigger. Uh, and eventually uh, they break onto the shore. Now, uh, we don't expect that um, all the storms out in the ocean that create waves are exactly perpendicular to the shore, but when you look out at the waves coming into the shore, they're always coming straight in. They're never coming in at a significant angle. And, and the reason is that you know, there are storms out there coming from you know, the South Pacific and the North Pacific, but when they get to the shore, um, they're always turning until you see them facing uh, exactly on the shore like this. Um, now, when you see the waves look like this, it's not thought that it's created by local conditions. Uh, th these very large waves with very regular periods are, are usually created by uh, large storms out at large distances in the ocean. It could be thousands of miles away. Um, and so one of the things we'll try and explain today is when you have one of those storms, how is it that you end up with this very regular um, procession of waves coming in? Okay, so this is a second example of what the ocean can look like. Um, so instead of seeing a nice regular behavior, um, you'll see what people call local wind waves. Okay, so here's a, a picture showing 
um, waves out in the deep ocean. And so here's a boat, and you see some shadows of clouds. But if you look at the waves here, um, you'll see um, there is a sort of component of waves that looks like it's traveling in this direction. You know, it's not extremely regular. Um, you can see some waves that look like they're maybe traveling in this direction, too. So, so it's not all going in the same direction. It's sort of jumbled. Okay? Um, now, it's thought when you have conditions like this, that it's more the local um, wind that's creating these waves. And if the local wind is highly variable, um, if it's changing its direction, if it's changing in magnitude, it's going to tend to create waves in sort of all different directions at once. Okay, so some days you have waves that look like you know, a jumbled mess like this, and other days, um, when it's dominated by these storms far away, then you get this very nice clean behavior. Okay, so how can we describe waves? Um, so if there wasn't a wave, what you would see out on the ocean is just, it would be, very, it would be flat. Okay, the, the water would all be at the same level. So what a wave is, is it's just a, a slight change in the, height, in, the, in the water level. Okay, so if here's the still water line, okay, when a wave goes by, uh, there will be alternating crests and troughs, crests and troughs like that. So the distance from, let's say, one crest to another, that distance is called the wavelength. Um, now, in California, if you ask someone what's a wave height, they would typically tell you it's the, difference, it's the distance from the trough to the crest. Okay, you have to be careful about this. If you go to Hawaii, for instance, and you ask what's a wave height, uh, they would actually say it's from this still water line um, to the crest. So if you're a surfer and you go to Hawaii, you have to be careful, because when they say it's a five-foot day, it's actually a 10-foot day for, for Californians. So you have to know when to go out. Um, now, now, when a wave goes by, it, it doesn't mean that all the water in the ocean is, is moving in one direction. W what it actually means is that um, each little you know, piece of water is actually just moving around, around on a small orbit. So particles which are near the surface will be moving on circles like this. Um, and then the size of the motion tends to go down um, as you go towards the bottom. And this is familiar. If you, if you swim down to the bottom of a swimming pool and someone you know, waves their hand in the water on the surface, then you don't feel much. Uh, but if you go up to the surface and someone makes a wave and then it comes over and hits you, then you can definitely feel that. Okay, so that's what this pattern here is showing. Um, now, in addition, um, in addition to the wavelength, the other main um, way that people um, characterize waves is through, their wave, is through what's called the period. And what that means is that if you're sitting in a certain spot here uh, and you just ask how long does it take for the water level to go up and down, up and down, that's the wave period. Okay, so let's talk a little, about, a little bit about the physics of water waves. Why do you have a wave? Okay, and so what it all comes down to is pressure differences um, between one point in the water and another point. So sitting at ground level on the Earth, uh, we're feeling the weight of all the air in the atmosphere above us going up tens of kilometers. Okay, and you know, that, uh, that pressure is by definition called one atmosphere. Um, so if you go down, let's see, if you swim down to the bottom of a swimming pool, what you'll actually notice is that you can feel pressure in your ears. So just by swimming down a few meters, um, you can actually feel a significantly higher pressure. Okay, the reason is um, water is much more dense than air, and so you can get you know, the same amount of pressure just by swimming down a few meters in water as you get by having you know, tens of kilometers of air in our atmosphere above you because the water is so much more dense. So, so the way that you get waves then is that um, if we look at this uh, part right here, where here's a crest and here's a trough, if you were sitting in the water down here, you would feel a higher pressure because there's more um, water above your head. Okay, so that water is pressing down on you. If you're sitting over here in the water, uh, you would feel lower pressure because there's less water pressing down, pressing down on you. And then as you move from here to here, you're going from a region of high pressure to a region of low pressure. And so, you know, it's familiar from daily life that when you have a region of high pressure and a region of low pressure, uh, fluid tends to flow from high to low. So, for instance, if you have a room and the room's been heated, then it'll be a, a little bit of a higher pressure than the space outside of it. So when you go and you open the door, then instantly you'll feel, you know, this wind coming out from that heated room. So, so it's the same idea. Uh, if you set up a region of high pressure at the crest and low pressure at the trough, then the water is going to want to move this way. 
And so this is the restoring force for water waves. So if you do a mathematical treatment and you write down the equations uh, and solve them, then you can relate uh, the period of the wave, so how long it takes to bob up and down, uh, and the wavelength of the wave, which you can see as they come into shore. So for waves that have a wavelength of about 100 meters, uh, they have periods of about 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, a wave is hitting shore. Uh, in addition, you can calculate uh, the speed of these waves, which is basically just their wavelength divided by the period of the waves. Um, so again, for a wavelength of about 100 meters, uh, they travel at about 10 meters per second. So for this um, fiducial length, 100 meter wavelength, it would take you know, many days for, for this wave to cross the Pacific Ocean. But, but what you can see now is, as you increase the wavelength of these waves, the speed increases, okay, like the square root of the wavelength. Okay, and what that tells you is, as you go to longer and longer wavelength waves, they're going to travel faster and faster. Okay, but this can't go on forever. It turns out there's a speed limit for waves. And, and the speed limit happens when the wavelength of the wave becomes the same size as the depth of the ocean. Okay, so when this happens, uh, we no longer call them you know, just ordinary um, water waves. Uh, they're called tsunamis in that case, okay, as we've all heard about. Okay? So tsunamis basically all travel at the same speed, and it's just set by what is the depth of the ocean. And, and that speed, um, you, you can, I mean, there's a very simple way to think about it, is that if you dropped an object, um, you know, basically the height of the ocean, okay, the speed that it would travel, um, let's see, so if you dropped an object in air <laughs> um, from an altitude which is the height of the ocean, basically if you dropped an object from an airplane, you know, which is roughly the depth of the, the, depth of the ocean, um, the speed that it had when it hit the ground uh, is roughly the speed that a tsunami travels at um, through the ocean. So it's hundreds of um, miles per hour. And that's why they can travel you know, very rapidly over entire oceans you know, in, in a, a fraction of a day. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about uh, the physics of waves, uh, let's, let's get back to the problem of trying to understand what we see when we go to the beach. Um, so let's talk about the birth of waves. How are they created? So waves, um, these swell waves, are created by large storms. Okay, and the way that it works is that in these storms, um, there's uh, enormous winds. And what the winds do is that first, they tend to generate very small length scale waves on the surface. So these waves are very similar to the wave you just see in your bathtub or in your kitchen sink. Uh, they're called capillary waves. But once you make these little capillary waves, then the surface of the ocean is much rougher. Okay, and the wind, as it moves by, it sees this roughness, and it sort of has a handle to grab onto, and then it can really start to push on the waves much more. Okay, and that's how you can generate uh, much larger um, wavelength waves once you have these capillary waves. Uh, now, there's, um, there's a limit to this. You can't create waves with uh, you know, extremely large wavelengths or extremely large uh, periods. Um, the maximum you can um, do is basically when the wave travels the same speed as the wind, um, that's about the largest length scale wave you can create. Okay, but the point to make here is that when you have these big storms, they don't just create waves of you know, one length scale. They create waves with, with all different wavelengths. But that's not what we see at the shore. So if you're creating them with all these different wavelengths out in the deep ocean, um, how is it that we see one dominant wave wavelength when we go out to campus point uh, and stand there and watch the waves come in? Okay, and the answer for this is that as the waves travel from the, the deep ocean to the shore, uh, they're sorted by period. So if we write down the formula for the speed of a wave in terms of its period, um, you see that as you increase the period of the wave, you know, as you increase its wavelength, uh, it travels faster. Okay, so what this means is that if you have a storm and you create all these waves, which have all these different periods, then we see the ones that have the longer periods first, because they're the first ones to hit the shore. After that, uh, we see the shorter period ones, because they take more time to get to us. Now, if you watch the Weather Channel um, on the marine forecast, they actually do this for you. They, sh they tell you what's happening with the local wind waves every day, and also what's happening with these swell waves from very far away. And if you, you can actually watch and, and see the period decreasing for, uh, when there's a large storm out in the ocean uh, as a function of time. 
Now the other thing is, if one day you measure a certain wave period, and then you go back to the beach the next day and you measure a, sh a shorter wave period, um, you can actually use that to measure the distance to the storm. Because for a certain wave period, you know how, how fast they travel, and you have the time delay um, for one wave to get there and the other wave. And so you can use this to measure the distance to the storm. And, and again, typically you find they're many thousands of miles away. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what people actually measure with waves. Uh, there's a buoy uh, right off the Santa Barbara coast um, that measures uh, properties of waves. So, so the way that it works is when a wave passes by, uh, the buoy will bob up and down uh, at the period of the wave, and so that will allow you to measure the period. Um, in addition, the buoy will tilt one way or the other depending on the direction of the wave, and so you can uh, infer a direction by, by how the buoy is tilting with time. So uh, here's a plot showing some data. Uh, this is the Southern California coast going from San Diego. Um, Santa Barbara is around here. Um, so what the colors show here are the wave height. So green here is waves which are about five to six feet. So here's the scale up here. Uh, and blue is waves that are about one to two feet. So as every surfer in the audience knows, living in Santa Barbara, you tend to get very small waves because you're, you're usually blocked by these islands if there's a swell coming from the south, and you're blocked by Point Conception if there's a swell coming from the north. So Santa Barbara will always be roughly in here. Um, you can also see interesting things that um, the, the islands basically block the waves so that uh, there's a shadow where the waves are much smaller uh, behind the islands. Um, so, so, this is, so there's actually two plots on, on here. This is the first plot that I've just showed on wave heights. Uh, this is a completely separate plot over here. So what this plot shows is uh, the direction that the waves are coming from. Okay, so this direction would be coming from the north. This means it's coming from the south. So on this particular day, it's sort of coming from the northwest. Um, now, um, this dimension of the plot tells you the wave period. So wave period's going from 18 seconds, 14, all the way down to 10. Okay, so on this particular day, you can see there was between 14 and 18 second waves. Okay, so, so it's not, you don't have all wave periods on the same day. Uniformly, um, from 10 to 18 seconds, you can see it really is mainly one period. And that's this uh, sorting of the waves because they travel at different speeds. Okay, thanks. I'll hand it over to Lars now. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so the, the first thing is the waves do tend to get bigger um, when they get very close to shore. Um, when they're out in the ocean, um, they would tend to stay uh, at, at roughly the same height. There's very little dissipation that would make their um, size go down. The reason why you see things get smaller here is, is just because it's sort of blocked by the islands. I mean, that's why it's smaller in this entire region right here. I mean, out in the open ocean, it, it's not really getting smaller. It's mainly due to the islands. Um, okay, the, the second question was, what does the depth of the ocean have to do with the speed of the wave? Um, okay, the answer is, when the wavelength of the wave is smaller than the depth of the ocean, then the speed that the wave travels at couldn't care less about the depth of the ocean. So those are called deep water waves. Um, it's only when the wavelength of the wave becomes comparable to the depth of the ocean that it starts to care about the depth. And those are these tsunami waves. Okay, but basically, as every wave comes into shore, uh, eventually it gets so close into shore that its wavelength is comparable to the depth. And, and that's actually right around the point where they start to increase in amplitude. You see the heights getting bigger, and then they begin to break eventually. And it's all happening one wavelength from shore. Uh, uh, okay, one way to think about it is that um, when you come into this region where the speed does de depend on the depth, um, as, as the ocean depths get smaller, uh, the wave tends to slow down. And so, and so picture, you know, there's, there's sort of different chunks of the wave coming into shore. And all of a sudden, this chunk slows down. So what it means is that these, this chunk here, it's still going fast, and it piles up. 
and these waves keep piling up um, and they sort of bunch up together and th since their energy is in a smaller region um, the wave height goes up at that point so, so it's, it's, the waves are slowing down and then at the same time they have to get bigger uh, in order to conserve energy yes I, okay, I haven't heard much. Um, uh, so the question was that um, there are now satellites that uh, are observing uh, waves in the ocean, and one of the what's been said is that the surprising thing is that they're finding many more rogue waves or waves where that have enormous, enormous heights, you know, hundreds of feet, um, than was previously thought. Uh, and then the other comment was. Um, that if there are rogue, you know, waves, there must be rogue troughs too, you know, that a ship could fall into. Um, so I, I, I've heard of the satellites, but I hadn't heard of that particular result. So I, I, I can't make a comment on it. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, so the, the, one of the points is uh, if, you have, if there's two different storms and they're both sending out waves, then when the waves from these two storms meet, um, you know, something you can see every day, I mean, just in a, in a bathtub, when the waves meet, then you get very large amplitude waves um, for, for that brief moment when they meet. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I, I, I could easily see that, you know, that would be one way of getting rogue waves. I mean, whether or not that's you know the cause of them out in the open ocean, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, the real cause. Yeah. Uh, yes. Question. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, okay, so there's, um, there's a simple explanation for this, which we teach, um, and how um, relevant it is, how accurate it is, I'm not exactly sure. But the basic idea is that um, if you now consider a storm out in the ocean, and it's not just a tiny point, but there's actually some extension to it. Okay, so let's say that this storm um, is 100 kilometers big, but say that it's 1,000 kilometers from the shore. Okay, so what could happen then is if you're seeing waves at the shore from both sides of this storm, it means that the waves from the back end had to travel faster uh, in order to get there as the, at, at the same time as the waves from the front end. Okay, so, so if those waves are traveling faster from the back end, they must have slightly longer periods. Okay, so, so let's say uh, that waves from the front end have nine second periods and waves from the back end have 10 second periods. Okay, so there's a one second difference in period between them uh, in order to get there at the same time. But what this means is that if you're sitting at the beach and you see that those two different types of waves initially have um, their crests getting there at the same time, then you know, roughly 10 wave periods later, you'll be still be seeing the crest of one wave, but you'll be seeing the trough of the other wave. Okay, and, and so they're not reinforcing each other at that point. If you wait 10 more wave periods, then you, again you'll be seeing the crest of one set of waves and the crest of the other set of waves. And so it's, it's really it's the difference in period that's giving you um, this every seventh wave. And in the case, every seventh wave is a myth, right? It's, um, it's really what's the size of the storm and what's the distance of the storm to you. And so if you live in a different place, there'll be, there'll be, the storms will typically be at a different place out in the ocean and they may have different characteristic sizes. And so it could be, for those people, it'll be every tenth wave or every, you know, uh, sixth wave. So it varies where you live. Okay. So as you already experienced, you're just like our class, which is that the more we teach, the more we have to learn. Um, because there's many things that Phil and I haven't figured out yet. Um, so...
Uh, so this is an example we also teach in our class that also has original research from the last five years, not by us, but by others. And I wanted to share this with you. So this is a sonar operator on a submarine. And uh, next to him is a snapping shrimp that's not to scale. <laughs> and so the question is, why is this man really concerned? Uh, and the reason is the following. A snapping shrimp generates his sounds by snapping its wrist joint. A bed of snapping shrimp produces a crackling sound. So these snapping shrimp were uh, known for many years, but were really discovered and studied in great detail um, in the 40s when they were discovered as a large source of noise for sonar operators below water. And um, so shown here is a uh, declassified report, uh, declassified in 1967 from the, uh, some of you might not have known, the University of California had a division of war research um, that was a report written in 1946, uh, at least it came out after the war, which was a report uh, studying this phenomena that was discovered in great detail when they started uh, having submarines in shallow water, which is that these snapping shrimp, which are in shallow depths, are a major noise source. And that uh, um, audio tape I played from you was from a 1960s sonar operator trainer manual, um, which has on it many sounds that you hear uh, just to let you know that you know this is okay if you hear this, don't call the captain. This is just snapping shrimp. <laughs> so I, 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 uh, I just have to share with you some of this text um, because it's, it's just absolutely hilarious to read these old reports. So early 1942 investigations of underwater sounds were begun from the beginning of field tests, a characteristic crackling noise of great intensity was observed. It was encountered first at various locations, the yada yada, La Jolla, and other places. The origin of the noise was shrouded in mystery during the first year of investigation. Though considerable progress was made in determining its spectral characteristics uh, and in establishing its presence in local coastal waters, over rock bottoms, around piers, and in harbors. It's only in shallow water, and as we go by, you'll see, I think, why that is. Then early in 43, it was finally established through laboratory tests of various animals and through field studies, et cetera, et cetera. Crackling noise results from the claw snapping uh, activities of certain small crustaceans known as snapping shrimp. Now, the snapping shrimp should not be confused with the common commercial shrimp, which is usually much larger and produces no noise, unless when you eat them. Uh, the sharp snap produced individually by these animals has long been known, but it hitherto been considered only a biological curiosity and not a source of significant underwater background noise. Now, thankfully, I have friends in high places, and in this case at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, Carl Hutter, the director who's actually here this evening, who was gracious enough to bring uh, some snapping shrimp, and I realized that we shouldn't pass this around during my talk because... Uh, uh, it's too dark to see, but I welcome all of you after the talk to come up and look at the uh, samples we have of snapping shrimp here in a jar full of probably something you shouldn't imbibe. Uh, okay. So uh, here are some images uh, of these uh, shrimp from the 1946 report. Uh, they're about five centimeters long. Here's the snap. As you can see, the, the snap is nearly as big as the shrimp. This is the, the jaw which closes. Here's a blow up of the claw. Here's the claw. Here's a blow up in the open position. Okay? So it sort of cocks, loaded, ready to go. And then in the snapper closed position. Okay? So again, this is about five centimeters. This is then a few centimeters. So the question is what causes the sound? Um, and this was the reported in Science which is a scientific journal, only in 2000, okay? So there's, there's a reason to still teach the physics because it's still an active field of research. This is just a blow up. This is, again, just showing the, a, a current version. Same thing. So here's the claw open. Here it is in the closed position. We know that the snapping sounds triggered by claw. The, it, the evidence uh, from the biologists is that the purpose of this is not to trap something in it, okay? It's actually to stun or kill prey within just a few millimeters. So the kill zone 
is a little is about the size of my pinpoint there, and anything in that region apparently gets killed. And the question was, the assumption was it was from the sound of the jaw closing. You know, the, this that that's the cause. And as I'll show you, that's not the right answer. Okay, but until 2000, it was believed that this was the noise. It was mechanical. The fact of the snap, the hitting, was the sound was the expectation for what caused the noise. Okay, well, as all good uh, scientists do, they say, well, let's do an experiment. Okay, so uh, this is why we didn't have shrimp tonight. <laughs> so they attached a shrimp on something here. They glued it down. Okay, they did this with seven shrimp. I don't know, they named them Larry, Moe, Joe. Okay, the thing likes to stay in the open position, so they have to tickle it, and I'll show you a movie of them tickling it to snap, to force it to snap. And then what did they do? Well, they had a hydrophone, basically an underwater microphone, to actually measure the sound, okay? And a very fast camera, uh, roughly 40,000 frame per second camera. So they both have images of the snap so they could see w uh, what was happening with the snap. And also then a hydrophone so you really know when the sound was created, okay? So let me give you the punchlines and then show you how they came to these conclusions. So the first thing they, they found immediately was that the mechanical sound from this claw closure was actually quite small. That this, this was not the big noise. That a high velocity water jet uh, is emitted from the claw during closure. Jaws open, there's water there. When it closes, it creates a jet of water. And that jet of water comes out at 70 miles per hour. Okay? Now, this they knew about uh, because actually it's a signaling mechanism. They actually use this to uh, signal their neighbors, their, good, their friends, not their enemies, to let them know, hey, I'm close by, you might want to stay away, this is my area. But the key of this, and this is what I'll explain, is this water jet's fast enough to what's, what's called cavitate, and I'll explain what that is. Cavitation is if you move fast enough, the pressure drops and you form vapor. And what was shown, and I'll show you this, is that you did indeed form vapor. That vapor then collapses, and it's the, it's the collapse of that bubble which is a singular collapse that makes the sound. And that collapse occurs about three millimeters from the claw, and that explains the, the range of their lethality, if you will. Okay, so that, that's what they show, but not, now let me actually walk through this. So this plot's really busy. Uh, sorry to show it this late in the evening, um, but don't worry, it's gonna, it's gonna still be fun. So here's the movie, the film strip, right? So this is the 60s, this is not the 60s, but pretend it is. Here's the film strip. Going across. So the first thing you notice here's the claws open, point one. Point two is the claws closed, okay? First off, notice the time here. It's one half of a millisecond. That thing snaps in a half a millisecond, okay? So it's, you know, if you could keep opening and closing it a thousand times per second. Now, on this, down here is shown the noise that they were measuring, sorry, the sound they were measuring from their underwater microphone. And so position one, it's sitting here at some ambient pressure. That's when it's open. Goes along. Here's the snap. When it hits, they get a little bump. They get a little bit of noise. But what they saw was that a full half a millisecond later, they saw this huge uh, noise. This pressure jump was almost a full atmosphere. So think sonic, sonic boom like you've never heard. This is the sonic boom that breaks your windows. Okay? You know, half of an atmosphere means the pressure drops a factor of two. It's a huge effect. Okay? And this was measured actually three centimeters away. This is a measurement at three centimeters. Okay, so imagine you're really close, right? You're uh, in trouble. Okay, so what happens? So I'll show you the movie in a minute. So here it's uh, snapped closed. And then you can start to see out coming from that, the water jet. Here comes the water jet, the jet of water. You can start to see it. There's some little, there's little bubbles in the water. Goes along, goes along, goes along, goes along goes along, and then right here you see this event, and that's the pressure spike three. That is a, the collapse of a little bubble that formed in here, the cavitation bubble, which I'll show you in some detail. And then you just get turbulence and mess the rest of the way, okay? And that's all this ringing. Okay, so it's very clear from this, just with the timing, that it's not this phenomena that makes the noise, but it's rather this phenomena. So that already was big news, okay? So let's look at some of these movies, because this is the fun part. Okay, so this is looking down the claw. Okay, so here's one piece, here's the other. So this is going to snap shut. Okay, so let's run that. Hopefully it'll work. Okay, there's no, no soundtrack for this.
Okay? That was obviously, that, that really happened in a millisecond, right? So they've, they've really slowed it down for us. Okay, now let's look at this one. Uh, first off, you see this? This is their brush that they're going to use to tickle it. Okay? Right here. So this is the claw. Okay? So it's just from another angle. Here's the brush. You see him tickling it? All right, and then it snaps. Okay? Everybody always wants to see these twice, right? Yeah. Okay, let's let's look at the top one again. I'll get to that. This this flash in this case is reflection of air bubbles. Okay? You are seeing a flash, but in this case it's just it's illuminated scene and it's just bubbles reflecting. But I'll I'll, I'll get to a different flash in a moment. Okay, there it's tickling. There it goes. Okay. Great. You can watch these. I've, I've watched these too many times. So. My family wonders about me. Okay. Yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea. Don't know. These are physicists. They probably said, well, you know, how do you get it to go? Right? You took a, I, I, that's my guess. I don't know. How does cavitation work? So I'm just going to show you two equations. Well, a long one. So if I have a fluid like water, which is really hard to compress, right? You know that it's really hard to compress water. If I take water and I squeeze it, it wants to go out. It doesn't want to compress. And in that case, uh, you can actually write down sort of a version of energy conservation, which is called Bernoulli's principle. You've probably seen this when somebody explains to you how a wing works, which is the places where the fluid moves faster, the pressure is lower, and so you build a pressure contrast across a wing. So if I have two parts of the flow, one place where the pressure is P1 and the velocity is V1, this is the density of water. Okay? So if I have any place in the flow, this combination of the pressure and the velocity is constant. So a different place in the flow for that same fluid element, if I accelerate it from, this, from region 1 to region 2, so I think region 1 is inside the claw, region 2 is inside the jet, um, then this sum has to be constant. Okay? So at the depth of, let's say, 10 meters, where they're down at 30 feet, that's roughly where you have to go to double the atmospheric pressure as Phil already told you. The pressure there is about 200,000 pascals. It doesn't mean anything to you. It's two atmospheres. That probably doesn't help either. That's what it is, okay? Um, you know, I could tell you in centimeters of mercury, like that helps, uh, but that's, that's, that's what they tell you on the Weather Channel. Um, so at that place, inside the claw, the velocity is zero, so the left-hand side is just P1, okay? On the right-hand side, the region out in the jet, okay, the velocity, I told you what the velocity is, so you might wonder, you might say, wait a minute, the velocity is really high, then I have to get this pressure negative to keep this sum constant, okay? So what if the velocity is so high that roughly this pressure goes to zero in the flow? Okay, well, I can calculate what velocity I need for that, okay? That's just given by the pressure I'm at, which depends on the depth and the density of water, which is just a number. That's 20 meters per second, okay? So if I start moving, something at 20 meters per second, I have the chance that I'll cavitate. By cavitation, what happens is that the pressure can't go to zero. Instead, what happens is you form vapor. If I take this liquid and I put it at very low pressure, I'll form vapor. So you form vapor bubbles. That's what happens. Okay. Well, this is a order of the speed of that jet that's in the, uh, that comes out. And by golly, that's probably why it cavitates. Right? Predicting the exact number here is difficult, but the clear prediction from this is that I go, if I go to larger depths, the pressure is much, much higher. And if the pressure is much, much higher, I have to have a higher velocity jet. And that shrimp, with its claw, probably can't get cavitation to occur. Okay? Um, now, you might say to yourself, that's obvious. Isn't that in the literature? And I'm happy to report it's not. Um, as far as I can tell, for some reason, the, the, the discoverers of this haven't made that clear point, or at least not in any papers. Um, so there's an interesting question about their habitat. They're always only found in shallow water. You can see why. At high depth, this mechanism wouldn't work. Um, okay, so what's the last thing I want to show you is just another movie of this. Again, there's, you know, it's hard not to show movies. There's a side view. This is, right here comes the water. And there's a cavitation bubble, and now it just sort of gets diluted. Okay. Here's from another angle, 90 degrees away. Doesn't really show you anything different, but you can see what happens. 
Now, the last thing to show is the last thing that they discovered, the same group. <laughs> Somebody asked about that flash of light. Um, well, well, that flash of light you saw in that image was really just reflection from the bubbles, okay? But there's a huge industry now of experimentalists who squish these bubbles down in the lab for other reasons and discover that when you compress that gas, it gets very hot. You know if you take a gas and you just compress it, um, its temperature rises. And so the little bit of vapor in that bubble, when it gets compressed, gets very hot. And so they were smart enough to say, well, let's, let's actually see if we can detect radiation. If that gas gets hot enough, it'll radiate photons. And lo and behold, here's the sound pressure of another snapping shrimp. I don't know if it was the same one. This guy's got two bubbles. Okay. Here is a, a detector detecting radiation, photons coming out. And lo and behold, at the time of collapse, there's radiation here and there's radiation here. And when you make the estimate, the temperature of the gas in there is 5,000 Kelvin, nearly the temperature of the sun. Okay? The duration of that flash, if you blow this up, is right here, is less than 10 nanoseconds. Okay? So up to 50,000 photons are emitted, uh, though in this paper where they make this measurement, they have no idea whether this actually is any biological significance. Uh, but it, again, is real proof that this cavitation occurs. Okay, so on that note, I'll thank you for coming. I, I, I can share with you some more noises. Um, but I thank you for all your patience this evening. Thank you. I'm sure Lars will be willing to... Well, I should play. I have to play one. You want to hear the two whales? All right, all right. All right. So look, when you go, you know, how it is you go on the web... You tell your children not to do this, but you do it yourself, right? Uh, you go the humpback and California gray whale, both of the baleen type, generate the following feeding and navigation sounds. In the background, you will hear the noises of the submarine from which this recording was made. First, the humpback whale. Okay, and then the, uh, whoops, let me go back. This is the gray whale. Now, the California gray whale. Great. Okay, thanks. And for those of you who want to, the, uh, we should turn the lights up. Charmian, could you flip the lights there? The, uh, for those of you who want to t take a look, here's some actual snapping shrimp uh, to see. So, uh, well, I presume these are captive from a long time ago. Carl can tell us. Yeah. No, it's not gender specific. It's not. Yeah. If they lose a claw too, apparently it comes back on a random hand, which is interesting. You bet. You bet. So, uh, absolutely. So, it, during the, the question is, does this relate to the cavitating noise from propellers on submarines? So, the answer is yes. And submariners know that you don't go too fast until you're at large depths. And the reason for that is so you don't create cavitation noise. So, absolutely. Same phenomena. Um, equally difficult to really predict exactly when it happens. But this ballpark velocity is, you know, I assume, what the submariners use. That's correct. And, and actually, a good place to hide if you're trying to hide is in a shrimp bed. <laughs> no, good question. The question is, does the energetic balance work? Do you get, you know, is this eating carrots or steak? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Don't know. Yeah, I don't know the answer. That's a good. That's a great, great question. Yeah. No, they they think it's the sound wave. So so yeah. So if you're, um, you can imagine a shock wave, uh, a large, a lar you know, we don't hear sonic booms that often anymore, but um, a large sonic boom will do a lot of damage to you if you suddenly get hit by a pressure fluctuation of a factor of two. That'll that'll stun you for sure. It's probably dead. That's right. Or or. <laughs> 
as, as, as Sarah liked to say, it's, you know, it's, it's awe and shock. Or... It's gonna... Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, so to be honest, I don't quite remember. Um, I know that Detlef Losa has come through, and I, I have a feeling he might have shown this in one of his talks. And then I, but I, what I've been doing for years for this course is basically any time I see something that I say, oh, that's interesting, I put it in a file. And that file's big. And then when you teach the class, you go through the file. So this was, I don't, to be honest, I don't remember. But there is a constraint, which is natural phenomena in California. So I haven't, I haven't disobeyed that constraint. Pardon me? Yeah, well, we, we, the other way you do it, the, we've added material by forcing the students to actually do research projects. Um, and that's helped us get new material. Yeah, Mariel. Yep. Apparently not. You know, I think they only get one claw, as far as I understand. Yep. Don't know. Yeah, there's, 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 uh, this, um, Darcy Thompson, there's a guy, uh, is it the guy at Harvard? Is it on the shape and size? He has a book. Yeah. It's on, on growth and form around shape and size. So, so the thing on the Redwoods, yeah, if, if you know, if, if we, I was allowed to give a two hour talk, uh, I would have shown the, the tree height stuff, uh, that was actually from, from a book that he wrote later. Yeah. Uh, which? Oh no, I wasn't going to talk about that at all. No, don't. No, I, that actually wasn't for the for the foam. Oh yeah, no, sorry, the very first image. No, I, I don't have an answer for that. Don't know. No, it doesn't mean it isn't known. That's right. No, no, I, I think I, I think you know, Phil. I knew this would happen, which is. Uh, you say, ah, great. You know, it's like when you meet a doctor and you can say, well, my knee hurts. And they say, well, I'm sorry, I'm a dentist. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's sort of the situation Phil and I are in uh, with this course. So. Yeah, so this relates to astrophysics because in astrophysics we have fluids and they move and they oscillate. And uh, there's a lot of the physics is, is common, but the applications are a little bit more extreme. So, okay. Derek. Yeah. So, so yeah, absolutely. So the speed of the wave as it comes in depends on the depth, and it moves faster in deeper water. So here's my here's you have to imagine there's a shallow right. It's getting deeper as I go out. So if the wave comes in, the part of the crest of the wave that's in the deeper part moves faster, so it gets refracted, if you will, onto shore. Okay. And so it is because as they come in, they eventually get their wavelength becomes comparable to the depth and their speed depends on the depth. And so the wave front gets refracted towards the shore. And um, so typically that's, that's you know, if, if it's a nice, beautiful sloping shore, you know, that kind of goes up, then there's plenty of time for that steering, if you will, to occur. Right, and that's what, as Phil showed, they come perpendicular. To, they're coming the other way because that's the only way they can get in in the channel. Okay, I think we should wrap up. Yep. Take a look at the snapping shrimp.